you know, I asked my mother a long time ago, I said, why don't you name me Shaquille O'Neal? And she said, because my grandmother told me that you will be somebody that will always be remembered. That's what she told me. I mean, because, you know, all my, all my other kids and uh, cousins are Brian, <laughs> Kenny, <laughs> <Really>? Tony, <laughs> Jerome, Mike, Shaquille. Mike Jr. Yeah. yeah, I was like, why'd you name me that crazy name? She said, because my mother told me that you're going to be, you're going to be world renowned. That, that, that name, Shaquille O'Neal, will ring bells. With the first pick in the 1992 NBA draft, the Orlando Magic selects Shaquille O'Neal from Louisiana State University. Well, puts it on the floor. And stops and he brought it down. He brought the whole goal down. O'Neal, a monster follow. Oh, my goodness. Shaq. Oh, you got to love him. Shaquille, same way. Every now and then, a college player comes along who seizes the attention of NBA Brass League-wide. LSU's Shaquille O'Neal is such a player. At this point, it appears he'll stay in college and not leave after his sophomore year, but he has until May 11th to decide. I spent some time with the Shaq earlier this week and found that he's learned to play this game one way. No matter who the opponent is, just, you know, just go out and kill him. If he's small, short, big, fat, tall, just go out and kill him. <laughs> who taught you that? My father. <laughs> Take no prisoners. I remember, I remember that trip we took down there to San Antonio and to talk to this, uh, to talk to this guy who everybody was talking about. Um, can you take me back to, to that stage of your career? You're at LSU and everybody says you're gonna be the number one pick and what your expectations were at that point for your career and, and or, or did you have expectations at that point? Let's go back to before that. You know, a lot of people don't know I was a football player and I, I love playing football. And my father comes in the house one day very upset. He has a paper and he throws it at my chest. He said, if you stop messing around, maybe you can be like this. I open up the paper, John Conkac signs 15 for three. Yeah, so we go watch the Hawks play the Spurs, and I'm watching John, and I'm like, I'm doing what he's doing now, and a little bit more. If I had stopped messing around and, and play like this, I could make five million a year. That's when I stopped putting, uh, you know, I put the football away and started focusing on, on basketball. My dream as a youngster was to make eight million for 10 years. And I already had it set. I had a little house. I was going to get a Jimmy Blazer and a Mercedes Benz <laughs> and a little house. I already had it. So yes. you've exceeded your expectations. Yeah, yes, I did. I really did. But, <laughs> and then I made a name for myself. And I decided to go to LSU because when I was in Germany, I was an awful player. Coach Brown. But awful by your standards or no, awful by was, you didn't know the game? I was, I was 13. I was 6'9". I couldn't dunk. I couldn't play. I was clumsy. Uh, I confided with Coach Brown. I said, can you send me some stuff on how to get stronger? And Coach Brown said, you know what? Whether you become a basketball player or not, I want to offer you a scholarship. Right there at age 13. Without even knowing uh, what I was going to become, he offered me a scholarship. So when I came back to San Antonio, man, I named myself and everybody was coming at me. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to LSU. I was close to home, and, you know, Coach Brown wrote me letters every day before I became the Shaq, and that's when I decided to go to LSU. Let me go back to when you're 13, and you're awful. Terrible. Okay, you're 6'9", and you can't dunk. Can't dunk, can't play. So you couldn't dunk at that point. Could you shoot free throws back then? Yes, I could. I <laughs> See, could. So you sacrificed that to, to dunk, huh? <laughs> yes, I did. You know, I was... <laughs> Funny story, and I, I know you're not going to believe it, and I know people out there are not going to believe it. I was a shooter before I became a dunk. Yeah, I don't believe that. No, I was. I was a shooter. So, like, uh, one game in, in, in high school, and that's why I miss my father so much, because he could, like, just tell me one time and it'll make me change my whole direction. I'm playing against guys 6'1", 5'8", 5'9", but I know they can't stop me, so I want to work on other parts of my game. So I'm dribbling between my legs, shooting jumpers, 
I got 40 points and we're up by 30. So I come down one time and instead of throwing it down, I do a finger roll and I miss. My father comes on the court, calls a timeout. Come on, man. This looks like yes. a movie. This, no, looks, this looks like. Seriously, you know my father. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah, he came on the court, timeout. <laughs> Your father called timeout. Yes, he called timeout. He grabbed me, takes me outside. I said, What are you doing? I said, You know, I'm working on my game. I'm trying to be like Dr. J. So he takes me like this and slams me against the wall. Boom! Ain't no Dr. J. You gotta be Shaq. And I was so upset at him, I just started dunking the ball every time. But when I started doing that, I started seeing players doing this. And I was like, you know what? We, we may have something there. So like whenever I dunk and get people to move back, then I know I got you. But the reason why he did it, he wanted me to learn how to dominate. And he was like, it's your senior year, you're going to college, you need to start picking it up. If you want to reach the John Concat dream, you need to start picking it up. And now Shaquille O'Neal joins the NBA and the Orlando Magic. I always tell people I lived the karate kid life growing up. My father did a lot of weird stuff, but it's helped me out to this day. Uh, one of the things he always used to do was whenever one of our teammates got hurt, he canceled practice and he'd make us go to the hospital and visit children. Uh, whenever we had too much clothes or too much toys in the house, he said, all right, clean up, PT time. We'd have to get all our toys, get all our clothes. He'd take us down to the Salvation Army. We'd hand out stuff. You know, he'd make me go out and cut grass and sell lemonade. You know, he wanted me to learn responsibility. He, he taught me how to respect other people, other religions. So all the stuff that he did as a youngster, it's, it's paid off very well for me. Set the record straight on the David Robinson story and the, the way I have heard it, probably from you, was that he stiffed you for an autograph when you were a, a kid and you held it against him. And you're not, now you're telling me this is not true? It's not true. I made it all up. Mr. Robinson, I apologize. I, I was taught to play with ferocity. I need to be upset. You know, something has to be said in, in an article or on TV about me for me to respond. Like, I used to like watching you guys and you guys saying, oh, blah, blah, blah. I used to be like, oh, OK, Ernie. OK, Chuck. OK, Kenny. OK. But David Robinson was the nicest man ever. I was, a, I was a big man on campus in San Antonio. And then the Spurs, they draft him. And he steals all my shine. So I meet him one day, and I was like, Mr. Robinson, can I have your autograph? So I learned a lot from him. I learned, as a big man, you, could, you can get easy buckets by running the floor. Also learned the spin lob thing. Up the alley, up slam through. O'Neal into the lane. Slammer! Oh, baby! Save the women and children on that one! I learned that from watching Dave Robinson. So I meet him. We have a conversation. He signs my autograph. First time we play as the Spurs, he kills me. He kills me. And my father rips me a new one. Oh, you, you show him too much respect. I don't care if that's Dave Robinson. You shackle me. You need to dominate. You need to go home and think about what you need to do. So I was like, you know what? He didn't give me this autograph when I was 15 years old. That pisses me off. So, like, from, from from that point on, when I said that to myself, that he didn't give me all, he stiffed me for autograph as a youngster. I wanted to pay him back. That was my way of competing with David Robson. Hill delivering two. Oh! And the foul! Shaq spins. Oh, the extra move. Did he ever call you out on that? Did no. David in all these other years ever say, what are you no. talking about, man? I never stiffed you on an autograph. <laughs> but you know what? I saw him with his sons. And, you know, his son is a, uh, was a wide receiver at, at Notre Dame. So I think I saw him, matter of fact, last year at the All-Star Game, and I pulled him to the side. I was like, David, I apologize. I made up this bogus story that you never gave me an autograph, but that wasn't true. He was like, Shaq, I know. I know you, Shaq. You're just a jokester. So, you know, he... Had he heard the story my... before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he heard it. Yeah, but it wasn't true. <sighs> Oh, boy. 
<laughs> man. It was on every highlight reel everywhere when you were tearing down backboards. Were you just trying wherever you could to make that happen? I mean, when it happened in New Jersey, uh, were you trying to consciously trying to yes. do it and, and trying to add to the lore of, boy, you've heard a lot about Shaq, you've seen him do everything, and now this? Yes, because playing in Jersey, where I'm from, all the family was there, had to perform. Also in Jersey was the only man to ever dunk on me in the NBA, Derek Coleman. Derek Coleman got me with a left one time, and so every time we tried to play Jersey, I wanted to let him know that I was coming. So when I tore the backboard down, I was trying to do it. On the floor. And stops, and he brought it down. He brought the whole goal down. I mean, that thing came straight down. He I mean, brought the whole thing down. Well, it broke off right on the, on the fence there, on the hands there. Chance to play with Penny uh, in Orlando. Um, why did that run its course? That's you know that seemed Shaq like wow was, inside outside. What a combination! Was, what a uh, one-two punch! Why was, did that run its course so it was quickly? Perfect. It was the the Magic Johnson Kareem Abdul Jabbar remix. I met him on a set of Blue Chips, and I uh, I came back and. I tested out my general manager skills because you, you hear other people, Jordan got him traded. Or, uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm the guy on the team. Let me test this out. Go up to John Gabriel and say, listen, I know we got the first pick and I know you want C Webb, but I'm just coming off this movie set and this guy, Penny Hardaway, he's he's the man. We need to get him. And the first day, you know, uh, uh, and then I kind of had to throw it out there. Well, if you don't get me the guard I need, my deal's coming up in two years, I may have to do something else. Politely, mm -hmm. respectfully. And they said, okay. So they interviewed Penny and, you know, they brought him down and, you know, we played together all summer and we was dominating all summer. And it was like, you know what, this could work. They, they told me that they were gonna pick Penny, but then they picked T-Web and I, I damn near tore, tore my house up. Like, oh, you lied to me, but I was upset. And then, wait. And then I saw them switch hats. I was like, okay, they kept their promise. Now let's let's get it cracking. And Hardaway runs it out. Ahead, check the catch and the stop. Then I made the call to Horace Grant because I saw he was just running in Chicago. And I said, nowhere we let a, 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 a power forward go, but I can get one that's pretty good with championship experience. Uh, Horace came, we got a couple other pieces, and we were on our way. Uh, I think the business of basketball interrupted that uh you know because i was i was always taught to maximize my potential and you know my deal was up and you know i, I knew i was a big name guy in, in the league and i just wanted my, my my fair share and the funniest thing is i was getting ready to sign 80 for 20. i really was 20 a year would have been mm -hmm. plenty for me because my first contract was 40 million for seven years so 80 for 20 would have been good and something said, don't sign. So the next morning when I wake up, da -na -na, da -na -na, Alonzo signed for, I think it was 110. No, Alonzo signed for 115, Jalen signed for 110. So I, I think my quote was, if you pay 110 for a BMW, how much does a Mercedes cost? <laughs> Sounds like something you'd say. <laughs> yeah, so I uh, went back in. And you know, I learned in college, you start high. So I said, okay, 150. I think kind of pissed the Orlando Magic off a little bit. And, you know, we went through a rough negotiating. And then uh, my agent at the time, Leonard Armato, matter of fact, I was here in the Olympics, 96. And he says, uh, Jerry West wants to talk to you. And I, I go in, in Jerry's suite, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. He says, I got some good news and, and some bad news. I said, well, what's the good news? He said, I can come close to that 150. I said, what's the bad news? He says, not 150, it's 121. So we called the Orlando and we gave them a chance to match it. They didn't match it, so I signed that night with the Lakers. And I knew I knew I was gonna to have to start all over. And if the Lakers didn't have a similar team, minus Penny Hardaway, 
I, I wouldn't have did it. But, you know, they had Nick Von Van Exel, pretty good. They had Eddie Jones, they had another big guy, Eldon, Eldon Campbell. And then Jerry is bragging about some kid saying, I'm working on something right now. Just remember this name, Kobe Bryant. Like, he kept telling me that name. I was like, okay. And it, it worked out. You know, it, 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 it turned out to be one of my better business decisions.